Uh, our speaker today, as you all know, and you're all eager to hear her, is Laura Carlson, and she's the director of the Americas program at the Center for International Policy in Mexico City. She calls herself a, uh, let's see what she calls herself, she says she is a feminist international relations analyst and writer. And she's written extensively on NAFTA, and NAFTA is the topic that she's going to do today. Uh, we will, she will speak for a while in Spanish and in English, and we will leave time for questions. We want to encourage you to ask questions, but as usual with questions, questions are not a speech. So, <laughs> I want to introduce Laura Carlson, and we want to thank her very much, and thank you all for your patience. Well, I'm overwhelmed. <laughs> thank you all for being here. It's an honor to be with you. And it's always a great pleasure for me to be in San Miguel. And today I want to talk not so much about NAFTA in particular, but about the U.S.-Mexico relationship, which is a very broad topic, uh, but there's some points that I think are particularly critical now. So I wanted to ask before we got started, ¿Hay alguien aquí, una pregunta, ¿Hay alguien aquí en el público que solo habla el español? Nadie. Entonces, yo creo que para aprovechar el tiempo, la propuesta sería hacer este, la plática en inglés. ¿Sí? So I think, you know, what we'll do then, because then, otherwise, you know, I get to talk, talk twice as long, we have, and we have, um, and I can cover a little bit more. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that then. Thanks. Now, what I want to do is, you know, in the blurb to this talk, we talked about relations between the United States and Mexico being at a low point. We were shocked, many of us, to see when the campaign of, um, start, when Donald Trump's campaign started, we were shocked to see that it was really focused on Mexico. We've really never seen Mexico be a focal point of a presidential campaign. NAFTA had come up a number of times and was used as, kind of as, as a political issue to be for or against NAFTA, but this Mexico bashing as a central point of campaign and as a lightning rod for what were openly xenophobic and racist policies was something we'd never seen. And we knew it was going to have a major effect on U.S.-Mexico relations. So now, a year later, we've been looking back at what has actually happened. One of the main things was the anti-immigrant uh, sentiments and policies that Donald Trump espoused. Now, as you can see in this first slide, the expectations of what happened were a little bit different. The ICE removals of, of uh, undocumented workers were actually lower in 2017. Now this is fiscal year too, so it includes not just Donald Trump's first year, but for the ending four, four months of the Obama administration, but that's how they do statistics. And, but in, in any case, they were lower than they were during the Obama administration. However, the removal, the interior removals, what they call people who are not arrested at the border but are arrested inland, and the administrative arrest were way higher. Now what's an administrative arrest? An administrative arrest means that the people who are taken in are guilty of nothing more than undocumented migratory status. So what they did is they changed the emphasis from, from removing criminals who had other types of crimes on their records to uh, a basically a much broader net that has resulted in the statistics. Now, many people looked at, look at this and they say, well, this indicates that it was a certain amount of bluff, that there were going to be 11 million undocumented workers that were removed, that there was a strategy to remove people from the United States. I don't think so. I think that this is just the beginning. The other thing that's happening, I don't have the graph, is that there are far more detentions than they used to be. So what's happening is that they're going through communities 
And uh, they've cast this broader net so that anyone, or a large number of people who doesn't have, don't have their papers in order could be subject to removal. And at the same time, they're taking people to prison instead of deporting. That means that they're squeezing out of these anti-immigrant policies uh, economic gain for a private prison system uh, and then deporting people afterwards. This infrastructure for mass deportation is really just being put in place. There's nothing to indicate that that's not the way things are going to go because as you all are probably aware, the rhetoric of um, creating, they don't call it openly, but a white supremacist society and eliminating immigrants is still there. And the motivation is still there for this small group of very wealthy white men to maintain control, they have to start changing U.S. demographics. What the census is telling us now is that by 2044, what we refer to now as minorities, and that is African Americans, Latinos especially, the largest growing population, and Asians and others will then be a majority. And for them, this is a nightmare scenario. So there's really a very cold and well thought out strategy behind the removal as well as some real kind of gut racism that goes along with it. Now, a lot of people also point to these statistics and others, like we're I'm a foreign policy analyst, that have to do with uh, foreign policy and say, we're not seeing a major change in Donald Trump from what actually happened during previous administrations. Again, I think it's really dangerous to consider that this is what's going on. In other words, that the United States has always been interventionist, the United States has always, has always promoted this type of an economic model, and Donald Trump is just more of the same, but who tweets a lot of crazy stuff, you know? Um, I think that we are in a moment in which we're looking at a very different kind of an administration. I think that it's significant that this is the most anti-migrant, anti-woman, anti-people uh, of color administration that we've had openly. It's brought that kind of discrimination and hatred in many cases into the public sphere and it's presented it as if it were a legitimate policy option. This has huge risk, presents huge risk for people living in the United States, especially migrants, and Mexican migrants make up the vast majority, but it also presents huge risks for people living in Mexico and in other countries throughout the world. Um, in this talk, what I want to do is I want to, I want to talk about those risks. I want to talk about the threats that we're facing at this moment as something that is uh, unusual. But I also want to talk about the resistance. You know, last year for me personally was, to quote badly probably, the best of years and the worst of years. On the one hand, it began with the shock of Donald Trump being, being elected president. I covered the elections in Washington, D.C. And um, it broke my heart. Even before he was pronounced the winner, I felt how could someone who, who, who talked this way about two countries that I love, I've now spent half my life in the United States and half my life in Mexico, uh, be elected by the, by the people of the country where I was born and raised. You know, someone who talks this way about where I am and the hatred for the people that I now live with be elected by, not the majority, you know, but enough to make it to the, through the Electoral College in the United States. Since that happened, um, in, over the year, we began to try to respond and to try to see what the actual impacts were going to be and how, and what could be done about it. Uh, so, so I did a lot of traveling. This picture in particular is, par, is from a caravan that we did in April along the U.S.-Mexico border from Sacramento and then going south from San Isidro to East Texas on the U.S. side called the Caravan Against Fear. 
And the idea was to try to get a sense of what was happening to the immigrant communities after the election of Donald Trump in the United States. As you can see, there were a lot of events where people came together of all colors to defend the immigrants. And we also noticed a big difference between states. In California, they were promoting a law that was eventually passed that made California a sanctuary state where no one could rout out people who were in schools or in hospitals or in courthouses because of their immigration status, members of the community. And that law passed. By the time we got to Texas, we were in a completely different situation. In Texas, there was lobbying going on to stop a bill that would make it illegal for any local jurisdiction to not cooperate with ICE fully and report immigrant status even if it was a victim who came to report the crime. The result of this, as we saw, was in fact a lot of fear. And there was a lot of fear on the part of all kinds of people. By forcing immigrants deeper into the shadows in the United States, we began to see situations like, for example, there was a 70% drop in domestic violence reports by Latinas in Houston. Does anybody believe there was a 70% drop in domestic violence? When they're forced, when vulnerable people are forced back in the shadows, they become more vulnerable. People were so used to ad adapting to situations in the United States, even migrants that had lived there for years that we ran into too, for example, when a young woman who was renewing her DACA status in Arizona, we said, well, has your life changed since Trump was elected? And we said, well, no, you know, we're here, we're getting, trying to get this DACA status, and this was before it was rescinded. And, uh, and they said, oh, everything's the same. They go, oh, well, we don't go to the park or on vacation anymore. We don't go to the park or on vacation. Yeah, and, they, and another said, no, I can't drive my kids to school unless I go, like, like at the break of dawn, because if they stop me and I don't have a license, I could be sent home. And then I wouldn't have my kids anymore. And all these little things of daily life that we take for granted began to come out about what was really happening as a result, not just of the policies, but of this atmosphere sphere of, of fear and of persecution that was being created purposely within the United States. The other interesting thing was in... Um, um, you know, the people who lived along the wall, some of the, the key policies that have to do with us here in Mexico uh, of Donald Trump, everyone knows what they are. In addition to immigration that would affect and already is affecting millions of Mexicans who live in the United States and affects Mexico as they have to return either voluntarily to escape persecution or, as, uh, or deported from the United States, there's the wall the big symbol of when two neighbors, two allies, become, by definition of just one, enemies. And there's also uh, the renegotiation of NAFTA, a number of threats regarding tariffs, and a whole image of Mexico as being the, em the enemy to Mexican workers that take U.S. workers' jobs, Mexican products that displace products made in the United States, Mexican in, in incentives to move factories south of the border, uh, Mexican migrants who are criminals and who are killing people in the communities when we know that the crimes, violent crimes committed by Mexican migrants or any migrants are far below the rate of, um, of crimes committed by people, by U.S. citizens and particularly white citizens. You know, it began to create this, uh, and it's been going on for a while, this huge image. But when you talk to people who actually live where they're going to build this wall, supposedly, they're at the prototype stage now, and is, he's looking for funding, what you find is a completely different attitude. This is also members of the Caravan Against Fear, and here they are at a church in Tohono O'odham, an Indian reservation that straddles the border in Arizona. And this Indian reservation has decided that uh, they will never permit a wall to be built on their border. They, they pronounce that. Here's the, here's, the, um, here's the chief of the tribe who's actually said over my dead body. 
Yeah. <laughs> that it doesn't come to that. Um, and, the, and even in these really conservative towns in Texas, like Hidalgo and others, people are not only opposing the wall, they're terrified of it. Because they know what it's like to live as an integrated region between the United States and Mexico, where families live on both sides, where trade takes place at, at the tune of millions and millions of dollars a day on both sides, um, and where their economy and their cultural and social life depends on what happens on the other side. So this gets beyond the ideology, and when it comes right down to it, most of uh, the population, particularly in the area that would be most affected, is opposing the wall. But now it's, it's a badge of honor for a president who has none, and <laughs> It's, um, and it's um, a promise to a base that is really the lowest common denominator on, on the Mexican population, in the U.S. population today. Here's one in Spanish that I'll translate. How can we characterize, then, the foreign policy of Mexico, of the United States, and how it must, it, it will affect us? This is a this is called the borderization of foreign policy. And uh, essentially what it means is that through a series of executive orders and memorandums from Homeland Security, where, as you recall, General John Kelly was put in charge and then moved to the White House, and now Kelly's um, close associate, who is, is carrying out the same policies there, um, put the emphasis on the wall, detention, deportation, the rescinding temporary protective status for Salvadorans and Hondurans, eventually Salvadorans now and Haitians, um, rescinding DACA and border security. And I put that in quotes because we'll talk about it later. Uh, it's, it's, it's a concept that has been completely distorted not just during Trump's administration, but since from, from many years back. Um, then John Kelly came down to Mexico and visited the southern border, where he began to initiate what's been going on for a while, the same kind of mili militarization policies there between Mexico and Guatemala as we see on the northern border. With the, with the purpose of stopping Central American migrants from coming up through Mexico and getting to the United States. So now we see the Mexican national territory, all of it, from north to south, being used as a buffer zone for at the, under control of the same overall policies of the United States to stop immigration before it even gets to the northern border. Um, this was followed up by a meeting in Southcom, just to underline how much of this policy comes straight out of the Pentagon, in Miami, and to talk to the South, South Central American countries and to ask the Mexican government to take on this job of repressing migration that was coming up from the North. Much of it actually not just migration but refugee flows because of the degrees of violence and unlivable conditions that people are fleeing from in the Northern Triangle countries, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador of Central America. We have this group, as I mentioned before, of white supremacists that are very, very um, insistent on concepts of purity within the United States. Only European migrants are real Americans. Um, migra migrants and immigration as a contagion, something that could infect, and this is part of sealing off the border as well, the United States. Uh, migrants as criminals, we saw this at the State of the Union address where they cherry pick a crime that was committed or allegedly committed by migrants and present that as the reason that these policies have to go through. Um, and hardening, what we call hardening the borders through militarization, um, both through the Plan Frontera Sur on the southern border and what's been going on for many, many decades now on the northern border. In Mexico, the way that we, uh, the policy 
goes back to the Merit, Merit Initiative. It's a policy that was started by George Bush and then continued by the Obama administration and from the science that we have so far, including Tillerson's recent visit to Mexico, will be um, increased, although funds have gone down somewhat, under the Trump administration. And that is, the parallel for that is Alliance for Prosperity that we'll talk a little bit more about. That's the Central American part of it um, tomorrow in, tomorrow when we look at what's happening in a more regional way. Now coming back to the concept of border security, this is spending that goes from 1975 to 2015, and it's, it keeps going up since then. Um, and basically what it shows is it's $18.4 billion for border security. Now, um, a lot of that money has been a boondoggle when you begin to look at it. There have been like censors, at millions of dollars paid to Boeing to put up sensors to try to catch people coming over the border, and it turns out that they were sensitive to grass moving and to cows. You know, there's no way to even monitor it. Um, there's a whole lot of programs, and of course, as we all know, they never work to stop either the flow of migrants and especially the flow of, of illicit, of criminals and of, of prohibited drugs in particular. This, what it shows you, is that this is all increasing at a time when migration from the South is actually going down. So by the time you get to 2015, you're paying $45,000 a migrant for, an, for, for apprehension. And by the time you get to probably where we are, the calculations, I can't remember if it's for maybe a couple of years in the future, where that that price at the way things are going, in terms of the increase in border security, was going to get close to 100000 and the way that migration is going down, $100,000 a migrant. Well, you could send somebody to Harvard, practically, for that. And imagine if you did. You know, that's one of the things that I think is really important for us. Imagine if we did do something better. Could we have better results than this at far less cost? I think there's no question that the answer is yes. The other problem with this is that, you know, this process has continued and been fed over the years through a bipartisan agreement, and that continues to be the case. So what happened there? For many, many years, there was an idea on the part of the Democrats, if we give them border security, they'll give us immigration reform. It's obvious that it never worked. And what, and, but nobody thought about what the cost of that was going to be, aside from the multi-million, billion dollar cost to U.S. taxpayers. And in many ways, in the, the, the Trump phenomenon now is a result of the cost of that. While Democrats were thinking that it was going to be just some wheeling and dealing kind of a thing, they were creating not only this giant infrastructure on, of security on the border, but they were feeding this image like everything that's south of that border is a threat to us. So as that image began to grow and grow, it became easier and easier for Donald Trump to manipulate the vote and to take it farther than anyone really thought that anyone could in mainstream U.S. politics to the point where it became you know, a main point in a winning campaign. Okay. In reality, I, and the reason I put border security between co quotes is because there's actually, we've done a lot of research on this, a reverse relationship between security, the programs, both the United States and Mexico, especially the war on drugs, and, um, and militarization, and actual human security. First of all, the intensification of the war on drugs, which most of the victims' organizations here um, were with disappeared family members of the disappeared and um, migrants who are searching for the disappeared, as well as the movement for justice and dignity a few years ago of Javier Cecilia that some of you might know. And if you talk to those people, they'll say, what war on drugs? This is a war on us. 
33,000 people recognized for, uh, by the government as disappeared, and the number is likely to be far higher. 160,000 deaths. This last year, 2017, was a record year for violence. Right when they were talking about it being under control, it was totally out of control. And uh, it, we're not quite sure if when it was supposedly under control, some of those statistics statistics were being manipulated, but we know for sure that violence did explode again in 2017, and basically for the same reasons that it exploded in 2010, 2011, and 2012, which is we have this military perspective that's funded through the Mission Merida Initiative by the United States, and sending the soldiers, the armed forces, out into the streets, and when they do that, a number of things occur, but the most common one is they take out a kingpin, it's called the kingpin strategy, they still defend it, they know it doesn't work, they know it causes bloodshed, but they still defend it. They take out a kingpin of a cartel, and there's a war. There's a war for succession, or another cartel comes in and sees that the first one's been weakened, and that there's a turf war. The Good guys versus bad guys has completely broken down because of the complicity between the Mexican security forces and, um, and corruption within the United States security forces as well and, and organized crime. There's actually been an erosion of rule of law as we've seen the stakes rise. We've had an increase in, the, in arms that are used. There's arms that are are stolen or sold by the armed forces, the arms that have been smuggled from the United States. It's just up the ante in terms of violence through this strategy of fighting violence with violence. It's also created this means of social control by the state, which I think is explicitly one of the interests of the Trump administration and the US government, because it means that they're in a position, and it's happened in several areas, to put down local uprisings, which could be, and often are, local uprisings to defend land and territory from land grabs, or to remove populations that are rich from areas that are rich in natural resources, especially now um, either drug trafficking routes, because it's the interest of organized crime to do that, or now areas that have been found to have petroleum that's subject to extraction through fracking. There's a militarization as a threat against democracy, which we'll talk a little bit more at the end, because we're in a critical moment for that. The attacks on migrants and the Trump policies of interventionism that we talked about before, and beginning to conflate you know, the, the gangs and even migrants themselves with transnational criminal organizations and terrorists. Now, I, I said that, the, that uh, in trying to read last year and figure out what was going to happen, and I did a lot of traveling, and I wanted to mention another trip, which was the caravan of Central American mothers through Mexico. In this case, the, these are mothers whose, whose children, grown children in most cases, you know, have disappeared throughout Mexico, and what they're finding, too, is that the situation is getting worse with this hardening of borders. The more criminalized migrants are, whether it's in Mexico or in the United States, the more vulnerable they are. And the more vulnerable they are to corrupt um, security forces and to organized crime itself. This is, this is one of the pictures, though, of resistance that uh, we saw all the way along in the caravan against fear on the northern border in the United States, U.S. southern border, and also here in, in southern Mexico. These are women, and again, it's, it's no coincidence that they're women. In most of these movements that were defending migrant rights and defending other types of rights that were coming under increased attack under a Trump presidency and in the context of what that means for Mexico, they're women that are leading those organizations and that are leading those movements. Every one of these, you can see the pictures, some of them, of the person that they're looking for. They're going from town to town. They're asking people. They're standing up to authorities who are covering for organized crime, and they're demanding justice.
there's some there is some very heartwarming moments in in these travels in this critical year last year and this is one of them this woman from Honduras had been searching for over 15 years for her daughter who's sitting next to her there on the bus she didn't even know she had grandchildren and through the movement through organizing she discovered they began to find clues they began to follow the clues they had done some legwork, but she still hadn't found her daughter when the caravan went through. I think we were in Tabasco at this point. And we were sitting there having breakfast, and one of the people in charge of the caravan of Central American mothers had finally found her. They didn't tell her. And she walked in the door, and she walked in with these two beautiful grandchildren. And it was hugs, and it was tears, and it was this... It was a happy ending to just, just one story. This movement actually has created over 200 happy endings like that. But the number of people who are disappearing along the migrant trail continues to grow. And with these policies, it's growing even more. Um, again, this is... Uh, this is a town of Aribaca, and this is a little town, I think it's about population 700, if I'm remembering right, in New Mexico. In Aribaca, the people um, are divided, but there's a group of people who help migrants that come through the town. And what they do is um, they give them water, and they give them food, and they open up their houses. And if they're hurt, they, they care for them. And this has been pronounced a crime, not just since Trump, but since before. It happens to be a route where it's in the middle of nowhere. And uh, so it's a very common route for migrants to cross the desert, as many of you know, over the years with criminalization and crackdowns in the major cities and routes. They're forced ever more into the desert where, where conditions are far harsher and more dangerous. These people organized and they began to receive um, threats from the federal government in particular. Their entire town is surrounded by, um, by migration checkpoints. They can't go in and out of their town without going through the checkpoints. They asked and they said, well, we're paying for somebody to be here to look for migrants who frankly pose no security threat to us whatsoever. What, what's the result? And they wouldn't tell them. So they said they wouldn't give many statistics. Have you had undocumented workers? Have, there, have you known a crime um, by this extreme expense and by circling, you know, surrounding, basically occupying our town? And so they created a vigil where they actually sat at the checkpoint and registered everything that the, that the ICE, you know, the Border Patrol did at the checkpoint. They actually came up with like zero results except for a very clear pattern of intensive, you know, secondary revisions, which means like what you actually pull them aside and then go through every, everything against the Latino population and a very clear pattern of, of racial profiling. And these people have been threatened. These people are a small group, um, and yet they keep organizing. There were no more deaths, they've linked up to other organizations. And they were a very inspiring example to see in terms of what was happening in, in a general context of fear. Um, I feel kind of bad because I really didn't talk about NAFTA. And several people said that they did want to talk about NAFTA, so I'll just put in a little uh, sideline there, because we also have been following the NAFTA negotiations. Now, the campesino organ organizations, the peasant farm organizations, both in Mexico and in the United States, for years have been calling for the renegotiation of NAFTA, or removing NAFTA from agriculture <coughs> in particular. Um, the workers' organizations have been saying for years on both sides of the border, that NAFTA was a factor in <coughs> keeping salaries down in Mexico, where the real wage is actually 
gone down since NAFTA went into effect, and in job loss and salary and unionization loss in the United States because of the mobility and fa and, um, of factories and of production. Now that the talks have been opened up, um, nobody expects anything good to come out of it. Uh, it's been another venue for Mexico bashing and threats that go back and forth. There's apparently been, you know, they always, as in most negotiations, take care of the points where there's not too much controversy first, and then reserve the points where there's comfort controversy. Those points seem to be like permanently shelved, at least for the time being. And now where we're at is a place where um, the legitimacy of these people to be no negotiating this agreement is called strongly into question. Why? Because there's, in July, Mexico gets a new president and then takes office in December. But the elections happen in July. Peña Nieto is one of the least popular presidents in the history of Mexico. Um, Donald Trump, increasingly, even workers, blue collar areas that voted for him are feeling that his government does not represent the interests of workers. The farm organizations are looking at what's on the table in terms for the, of this renegotiation re and not seeing anything that really represents their, their interests as well. So right now what we're probably expecting is that this will not move forward at all fast. There's still, and there always is, because we're talking about factor in the X factor of Donald Trump, you know, at any point he could just wake up in the morning at six o'clock and tweet that he's pulling out NAFTA. You know, we don't know, that could happen. And if that happens, Mexico's going to be okay. You know, it's really the 1% of Mexico that's going to yell and scream a lot. You've got to watch the financial community. If they decide to punish Mexico because of this, that could cause a certain degree of instability. But in terms of actual production and the economy itself, if NAFTA ends, the integration of the auto industry isn't going to end. Because it's to everyone who's involved in it, you know, it's to their advantage, except to the workers. So, so I think that's what's going to happen with that for now. And it probably won't be at the top of the binational agenda for a while. I want to move on then to, to this bilingual list that's what can we do? What can we do in, the, in this situation of, of such a rapid deterioration, not just of official relations between the United States and Mexico, but in the people-people relationship? As I say, there's a lot of signs that that's very healthy, and I think that's where the new relationship is going to be built from. But there's also signs that it's difficult. You know, in the United States, we're reporting more hate crimes against Latinos than they've seen in the past. And there's a clear correlation between that and the fact that Donald Trump made it permissible to hate Mexicans. We're seeing in, in the, I, I have not seen in Mexico the increased anti-American sentiment, anti-US sentiment. They talk about it in the press from time to time. There's been some, you guys will probably tell me, you know, what you're feeling here, but for the most part, there's been a long time in which Mexican people have distinguished between the U.S. government and the U.S. people, and especially when they know each other, when they know each other on the level of community, live together, and work together. So the first one is write back and fight back. We're talking about to a group of writers. A lot of you still follow U.S. news. Um, and what's going on in your local community or in your state. Some people go back and forth and have very strong ties on both sides of the border. As binational families, as bi binational people, we're in a privileged situation in order to speak out against what's happening and try to push things in a different direction. When I say write back and fight back, you know, there's letters to the editor when there's outright expressions of racism, of stereotypes, of policies that harm the people we love and the relationship between the two countries we love, say something. Let them know you're out there with this particular perspective that comes from living on both sides of the border. 
um, to opinion and policy makers, those who still have a vote in the United States, or uh, I'm, I'm a dual citizen, so I can vote in both places, you know, push people to do the right thing in terms of the Mexico relationship. Talk to friends in the whole indivisible movement. You know, the idea is to create a nucleus in the communities where people talk to each other and say, this is not who we are in the United States. This is not who we are as a society. This isn't who we are as a community. And this is not who I am. And they begin to find ways to, to push back, you know, to create alternatives in the spaces that still exist. Defend democracy, and this is very, very important. Um, we can't have politi policies that reflect the way we feel unless we have a say in the policies that are being made. We're about to go into a mess in an election here in Mexico in which the probability of fraud is extremely high. We have a situation where the opposition candidate has uh, about a 15 to 20 percent point lead at this point. Um, it doesn't look like that's going to really change. The pre-candidate is tanking at 10 to 13 percent. It doesn't look like that's going to change either. And the pan candidate, these are all coalitions, as you all know, you know, is, is somewhere in the middle. There is a desperate attempt to maintain power on the part, whether it's on the part of the pre or the pan, because there could be some, some cooperation at some point that takes place in that. But the, the basic motivation in this is to keep that left center front runner, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, out of office. So it doesn't matter who you support. If Mexico has an election that is won by fraud again, because there's 1988 and there's 2006, the chances of ever seeing in the near future, in our lifetime probably, a, tra a real transition to democracy and uh, the, the, uh, are very slim. I mean, it's a critical election. It's a time when authoritarianism could win outright. Um, with the new lay, the, the national interior security law, we could have a situation where the armed forces take greater uh, role in the government itself. If the government is, is taken over by fraud, there could be violence against opposition when people try to defend the vote. It's very important right now to start doing that, to encourage your friends to do it. But there's electoral observation being organized now, and there will be international electoral observation as well. So as soon as the, uh, the website's up and running, you know, think about going up to it. There's, there's real concern, especially for rural polling places, because they tend to be the ones that are least observed. observed. And uh, there's also some work going on in terms of what will be the prelude to any kind of fraud that takes place. So we can be in touch on that, but it's very, very important to Mexico and to the United States as well. Yeah, this is the last list. And so we're finishing up here with the 45 minutes of defense of, of human rights, freedom of expression, key to this group, freedom of mobility, defense of, tier, of land and territory, women's rights, stand up for them where you can, stand with the people who stand up with them because rights defenders and journalists are under attack. Um, we talked about the women, who, the roles they play both in leadership and the additional risks that they're facing, and then the electoral, the, the uh, coitura electoral, which means this political moment, that is presenting even greater risks. And finally, to, this, is, this is the last slide that just says imagine peace and justice in the borderlands. And imagine peace and justice between our two countries. Again, the most important thing is that with all these threats that are coming down, is to act human, you know? And what's human? It's not just a collection of individuals. It's a species, it's a race. It's one of the things I most admire about this community, too. There are many of you who could have come here from the United States and had a comfortable life, and that's it. And yet here you are, and you're sharing these concerns. 
the concerns I also have. We're thinking about them, we're talking about them, and you're involved in your community all the time. That's acting human. And that's the basic necessity of today and the threats we face today. So my profound thanks for being here, for caring, and for doing what you do for both of the populations. You don't cease being human when you cross a border. And yet, that's what they're telling us sometimes. So thank you very much, and thank you very much for having me here with you today. The micro microphone, Diego. Sí. Okay, we'll take a couple of questions. Whoever wants to ask a question, okay, we'll try this gentleman here. We want you to know that we are going to put this on YouTube, and so all of you can listen to it again. <laughs> and tell all your friends who didn't get in, and we're regretting that, but Laura, Laura's on, Laura's on tape. Uh, muchas gracias por la presentación. Uh, question on, you're talking about the election in Mexico, uh, because it's, all, it's going to be so important with the relation with, with Trump in the coming years. If Obregón wins Mexico City and loses the rest of the country, do you think he's still win? Um, I mean, I'm not sure about the statistics, but I don't think you can win Mexico City and lose everything else and still win. And also, there there has to be um, with the banking on is a certain margin. Um, so no, there would I think there would have to be support. And uh, from other parts of the country as well, and that's you know some parts the infrastructure that's going into the the um, the electoral politics. There's some there's some areas of the country where the infrastructure is greater and some where it's weaker. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you so much for your uh, assessment. Um, Mexico is not doing uh, very well in, in the area of respect of migrants. Uh, I mean, there is a long tradition, I mean, there's a series of documentation of human rights violations to that. Um, who is working or what measures would you recommend to improve the outlook, the, the politics, the, the migration policy and migration attitude? towards migrants in Mexico? It's a big question. You know, there's there's a number of groups that are doing um, that are doing work, you know, the shelters are very important to people who are passing through. I was down in Estatec and I've been to several this year as well, or last year. Um, and that's a mostly Jesuit network, but it's it's a number of different things. And the uh, biggest policy change would be to stop the militarization of viewing them as a threat. I think Mexico could easily go back to a policy of accepting people, of decriminalizing. And then the third thing that's super important is impunity. The, when, when you hear the testimonies of Central American migrants that are coming through, it turns out that a huge number of them, including rapes, robberies, extortion, you know, are being committed by security forces, by the Mexican police and armed forces, uh, with, with another huge chunk being committed by, by organized crime. But the fact that there's absolute impunity, impunity and collusion between those two is a signal that uh, migrants are, it's open season on migrants, and as long as that signal's still going out, they'll be still facing the same kinds of threats and dangers and attacks that they're facing now. Impunity in general is just a huge problem. Thank you, Laura, for your excellent presentation. Uh, Arabaca, 
uh, you mentioned was in New Mexico. It's in Arizona, actually, and we live about 30 miles from there. And there is a tremendous humanitarian effort by a group called the Samaritans, who put the water out there. Mm -hmm. And uh, on a weekly basis, they will take the, the jugs of water. Sadly, uh, they've been reported that some of the Border Patrol will go, and other people will go and cut the, the, the bottles to let the, the water go away in their opposition to migrants coming across. But uh, we'll take, or have all our folks where we live, uh, look on YouTube and uh, watch your presentation. Great. Yeah, I do apologize. Of course, it's in Arizona. It's hard to imagine that kind of meanness to just cut a water bottle when you know, when you know it's going to save a human life. Thoughts about the bind that, that the dreamers have been put into. They've been offered, 1.8 million have been offered the opportunity to stay in the United States and a road, a path to citizenship in exchange for the wall being built, uh, the end of families bringing relatives into the United States, uh, and other policies that are clearly racist. Yeah, I think it's a devil's bargain. You know, um, there's no doubt that the dreamers have a right to stay in the United States, but there's also a significant part of, of their groups that are against that. They don't want to sell out their parents mm -hmm. to be able to uh, attain their own legal status. It's a terrible position to be put into. And again, part of the reason that I talked about the border security is because if we keep doing this, it's just going to get worse. So to say, okay, we'll do the wall to save the dreamers, we'll put another couple hundred million dollars into these boondoggle programs as if Mexico were really a threat to U.S. national security, you know, it means that we could win the battle, but we will lose the war. And that's what I think this dreamer pro proposal that's on the table is right now. So we need maybe a battle of losing the war. There are quite a few Canadians here. Would you comment on Canadian-Mexican relations, and does it make any difference? <laughs> well, I think it does. Um, there's certainly been less Canadian-Mexican um, cooperation in the NAFTA negotiations that perhaps we expected. At the very beginning, there was a lot of talk about raising wages in all three countries, and there were some good proposals put out by the Canadians. It was certainly a positive message when the visa requirement for Mexicans with, was withdrawn. However, since then, my impression anyway, and, um, is that uh, there's there hasn't been a lot of solidarity, um, and, or nearly as enough that I might even have expected from the Canadian government under Trudeau, and that a lot more could be done in standing up to Trump, but we really have both governments, particularly the Mexican government, where Billy Garay, who is of course the, the uh, Secretary of Foreign Relations, and who, what they say is now the behind the scenes person in charge of the succession here, came out and said, you know, many people might not believe it, but we have a much closer and more fluid relationship with Donald Trump than we've had with previous administrations. That's scary. I mean, it, it's, it's complete, not to mention submission and being completely unconditional, but it's, it's really giving away so much in terms of national sovereignty and just defense of the dignity of Mexico. So you have Mexico doing that, and it seems that a little bit, you know, Canada's been much more accommodating than I might have expected to to this Trump government. Go ahead. Go. Ahead. To put another um, side to it, uh, gerrymandering in the United States has allowed 
Republicans uh, who backed Trump to take over. Uh, the Supreme Court put down the gerrymandering in Pennsylvania. And it was just reported today that the new rules that they set up are much more democratic than they were. So there's a possibility that this spreads to other states that there will not be the Republican majority any longer and that the Democrats can overrule Trump in a lot of these situations. Also, one of the billionaires who has supported Trump and the Republicans had said, I'm keeping my money and I'm not putting it into a party anymore. It's a start. Yeah, I want to just comment on that comment quickly because I think it's really important on the one hand that there's a possibility of a change in the midterms and uh, in the terms of the gerrymandering, this is a step forward, but we've also seen a number of steps by the Trump administration to suppress the vote and it's happening in states as well. Why is this important to us here? It means that we're looking at an interventionist U.S. government that has no administration, that has no respect for the popular vote. The popular vote is not a popular issue with Donald Trump because he lost it, you know? And so when it comes to will he defend democracy and the popular vote in Mexico, nobody can really have very high hopes in that regard. And that creates another extreme risk factor factor now for the Mexican the Mexican elections. On that too, it's important to know what happened in Honduras. They openly stole an election and the United States, the ambassador, who's not the ambassador but the charge of fed because there's no ambassador, you know, actually stood next to the tribunal when they announced this fraud to, to, to say, and we're backing this up, it was a very bad sign for Mexico. Um, I have a question about um, the deportees that are coming here to Mexico and what is the government, the Mexican government, do they have a policy or how are they starting to handle it? I was just talking to a taxi driver today and he said, oh, well, they're getting the jobs doing construction. I said, gosh, doing construction here, how much do you make? So could you say something about any type of work that's happening in the Mexican government or some other organizations for deportees? Yeah, I mean, in a, in a society where over 50% works in the informal in the informal sector, where there obviously aren't enough jobs, it's a real problem if, if the deportation becomes more massive, as we think it will, and then more people return because of the climate in the United States. There are government programs. I've interviewed a number of people. I have a television show called Interviews from Mexico, and they report that they're entirely insufficient. You know, for meeting the kinds of needs which are papers, documentation, legal matters, jobs, housing, education, trying to get the kids in school. There's a whole series of needs that they have um, that are not being met, even things that you would think would be relatively simple. So it's a huge problem. We're seeing some interesting organizing attempts, just the beginnings on the on the part of the deportees themselves, they're forming collectives to generate jobs and that kind of thing. If you ever run into it, please do try to support it. But uh, it's a problem and it's probably going to get quite a bit worse. Another question on the elections in Mexico, and forgive my ignorance, are there any international organizations that have any kind of clout in trying to protect the level of fraud? Yes, yes, yes. I think that probably international organizations can have a bigger impact in many ways than, than national organizations. However, going back to Honduras, we did just see an election where the Organization of American States, which is a principal electoral observation mission, came out and said, we cannot call this election because it was too dirty. It's too dirty to call. They came out and said that formally, and the election was called, and nothing happened on the international level either. So it just depends. There are organizations that can do a lot, but it's really going to be, depend on how much people, the international community, people at the grassroots, people who need to be talking to their own representatives in their own countries, you know, how much they're willing to say, and eh, well, it's Honduras, and eh, well, it's Mexico, you know, on down the line. If we stand up, there's something that can be done, and international organizations and individuals 
have a big voice in that.